everybody. Um, I have one very uh, brief thing at the top, and then I'm happy to dive into your questions. So, uh, over the last nine months, the humanitarian situation in Gaza has been dire. Uh, and from the beginning of the war until now, the U.S. government has been committed to getting aid into the Gaza Strip through every possible means, whether by land, uh, air, or sea. Uh, the creation of the uh, Maritime Pier was... Uh, helped to address this situation. Uh, despite weather-induced limitations, nearly 19 million pounds of assistance, including food and shelter supplies, entered Gaza through the pier. This is equivalent of enough assistance to feed 450,000 people for one month. The platform uh, was helpful in allowing more aid to enter Gaza, both directly via the pier and through the Ashdod port, and demonstrated the value of having enhanced communication and coordination between the United States, the Israelis, and humanitarian organizations to improve deconfliction mechanisms. This coordination cell, which supported humanitarian maritime operations, has demonstrated that ongoing coordination between multinational and humanitarian organizations is vital. Uh, it is vital to the efforts of uh, uh, to improve aid worker safety. In turn, creating a safer environment for aid workers will help humanitarian partners get assistance to people uh, in the greatest need across Gaza. This model of coordination has now been agreed upon by the government of Israel and to be extended to all of Gaza. This new process will allow for safer movement of aid deliveries through all crossings to include the vital land crossing we desperately need to be fully operational. The needs in Gaza are staggering and the humanitarian conditions in Gaza are unacceptable and very significant challenges remain for delivering sufficient life-saving humanitarian assistance to Gaza, including the closure of multiple land crossings, uh, insecurity, and logistical and capacity constraints. From the early days following October 7th, the President, the Secretary of State, and the U.S. government worked to open crossings and to facilitate humanitarian assistance, and we will continue to press for the conditions to ensure the safety of humanitarian actors and activities, open additional additional land crossing, remove impediments to the delivery of humanitarian aid, and do far more to prevent uh, the innocent loss of lives and the killing of innocent civilians, uh, including, of course, humanitarian workers. We know that more aid needs to get to civilians in Gaza, which is why we are continuing to work around the clock to broker a ceasefire agreement that would allow for a massive surge in aid to all in need and to see the hostages come home. Uh, so with that, Matt, I am happy to Sorry, dive into yeah, your so questions. Just on, just, just on the pier, so yeah. is it the view of the State Department that this um, uh, initiative was cost effective? Matt, we uh, we believe that this was a successful initiative. It was able to uh, well, I didn't uh, provide... It was successful. I mean, delivering, you know, one loaf of bread would make it a success, but... Um, was it cost effective? In terms of the technical breakdown, Matt, I'm sure my colleagues at the Department of Defense would be happy to speak to that. Uh, they, I didn't know our briefing in a, uh, a little bit later this afternoon. But what I can say is that we believe that this uh, effort was successful, and specifically because the peer and its existence and the work that happened through it uh, impacted aid delivery to northern Gaza. It uh, su su successfully de delivered millions of pounds of aid to the people who need it, nearly 19 million as I mentioned um, and its use helped uh, overall the increased flow of aid and alleviate conditions in northern Gaza. Uh, not at all to say that the situation is resolved or conclusive or anything like that but overall it was a uh, effort uh, that we believe was successful. Okay uh, and then uh, just uh, at the very top of what yep. you said uh, you said over the last nine months the humanitarian situation in Gaza has been dire. Is it the view of the administration that prior to nine months ago, prior to October 7th, the humanitarian situation in Gaza was just fine? No, Matt, not at all. Oh, okay. I, I was, of well, course, then. speaking in the context of the months following October 7th. Of course, the uh, Gaza Strip has uh, long been uh, a, an area that has needed uh, 
consistent humanitarian access, consistent humanitarian aid, and I didn't mean to imply the otherwise okay. with my comments. Right. Thank you. Uh, can I just follow up on the peer? Can, can I? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll come back to you, Jenny. I'm sorry. I'll defer to Jenny. Sure. But uh, on the peer, yeah. if, did it meet its goals? I mean, its goals as defined and so on, you, you believe that it met its goals? I know you mentioned that it fed 400,000 Palestinians for one month. That's one-fifth of the population for one month. But that was exactly the intended goal that it will feed 400,000 Palestinians for one month? Sorry, there was uh, not a uh, technical goal uh, mm -hmm. or a uh, logistics or a flow inflow or a throughput goal. What we are talking about, and when the president announced this at the State of the Union, what we were talking about was a uh, all of U.S. government effort to ensure that we were leaving no stone unturned and that we were looking at the issue of getting more humanitarian aid into Gaza through every angle. That includes land crossings, that includes airdrops, that included uh, this uh, peer option as well. That's what this is about, is uh, us trying to pursue every possible alternative to ensure that we can get humanitarian aid into Gaza. And in that effort, this peer was successful for all the reasons that I laid out. Now, certainly, uh, as I said to Matt, the humanitarian situation in Gaza continues to be dire, and we will continue to work with humanitarian partners, with partners in Israel, partners across the region, to look at what other avenues uh, are at our disposal disposal to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. I believe Ashdod Port will continue to play an important role, especially for uh, aid that is moving through Cyprus. Uh, we'll continue to work closely with our partners in Israel and others in the region to do everything we can to get more land crossings open. So this is not at all the, the not at all to say that uh, the humanitarian uh, picture in Gaza is is perfect. What I mean to say is that uh, the this pier served a, a purpose. We believe that purpose was successful in what it was able to accomplish, and we will continue to work hand-in-hand -hand with partners at USAID, at the Pentagon, and the region uh, to make sure that there are other avenues being looked at also. I defer to Jennifer, then I'll take my turn. Sure. Jen, go ahead. Was this aid actually distributed within Gaza, Vedant? Because uh, WFP had to suspend its operations due to security issues, and I know they did a one-off thing to move it all to their warehouses, but was it actually distributed to the people? My understanding is that uh, there has been, uh, some of the aid has been able to be distributed. I would defer to USAID and humanitarian partners to, again, speak to the specific throughput. Um, but, yeah, I don't have any updates on that beyond. And then the coordination cell you mentioned, when did the Israeli government agree to? I don't have any uh, specifics uh, on uh, on, on diplomatic engagements on that, Jenny, I will just know that this is uh, this is separate than the uh, uh, cell that we have talked about previously. When so this talk is a, this is a new cell. Correct, correct. Right. This is uh, specifically catered around uh, humanitarian aid and uh, as a uh, out product of this peer. Isn't this something that the Israelis had said they were going to be working on after the? Um deadly strike on the uh, World Central Kitchen Convoy? It's something, that we, it it's something that we continue to uh, uh, engage on with the Israelis when it comes to uh, ensuring that there's clear coordination. Uh, and like I said, this is a, a separate endeavor than and that then, was being talked about then. Are there any updates on the opening of the Rafa crossing? Where do those discussions I, I have no updates for you. Again, you, we've talked about this before. Obviously, the uh, closure of the Rafa border crossing is a, uh, a logistical hurdle, but also, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, was an important conduit for humanitarian aid. Uh, we're continuing to work and have discussions around that. Uh, but broadly, we are doing everything we can to get uh, a ceasefire agreement uh, across the finish line because we continue to believe that it is uh, the most um, uh, potent way to get a surge of humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. And then my last question on mm -hmm. Gaza, there was a very disturbing BBC report earlier this week about a man who had Down syndrome, whose mother said he was attacked by IDF dogs and left to die. Um, does the State Department tracking this report? Have you asked the Israeli government to investigate? I'm that? not. I'm not aware of this specific report, Jenny. Um, uh, and I let the defer to the IDF to speak to it specifically. Uh, broadly, though, not speaking to this specific instance, uh, it has been our uh, clear call that um, r rules of engagement, that uh, protections for um, uh, civilians be respected and abided by throughout the course of this conflict. But uh, I, I don't have or. Uh, much about these this specific um, incident, but I'm happy to check. Uh, Sorry, then I'll come to you, Nick. 
Yeah, uh, the Israeli Knesset yesterday voted against the Palestinian state ever. Do you have any comment on that? Would that sort of uh, make you adopt a, a different approach, or would you have uh, like a mechanism to ensure that there is going to be a Palestinian state despite now it is legislated into law or will be legislated oh, I, into law that no Palestinian state will ever emerge? So, look, Zaid, I, I'll let Israeli officials speak to their own um, legislative chamber and the um, actions that that chamber takes. But the United States is committed right. to advancing enduring peace and security for Israelis and Palestinians alike. And we believe that the uh, practical, practical and uh, uh, way for that is a two-state solution, a uh, Palestinian state that is standing side by side with Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that is the only way to advance and enduring peace, and uh, it is also something that we believe it is in Israel's security. Um, to realize this vision, uh, Israel must be a partner uh, to the Palestinian people and Palestinian leaders. Uh, and as we have said before, we will continue to engage Israeli leadership at the highest levels uh, in making this clear. Yeah, but the, you know, the Knesset makes the laws for Israel, like our Congress makes the laws for us in this country. So, I mean, with all due respect, if, we, if it, you know, remains contained to re rhetorical commitment, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. Would it make any difference? Though, is the United States, in other words, willing or able to take some steps to actually Sorry, make this I, happen? I, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and say that neither you nor I are experts in mm -hmm. uh, Knesset law and mm -hmm. uh, 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 legislation and mm -hmm. um, things and products that come out of the Knesset, so I, I will leave uh, that analysis to others. What I can say is that the United States' approach to a two-state solution um, has not changed. Our prioritization of that has mm -hmm. not changed. So can I just Sorry. No, no so you have no opinion at all on this? We certainly have an a, a opinion, Matt. Well, I just, what, what I don't have is what, an analysis. What, what is it? What, what our, is a, opinion? our opinion is that we believe that a two-state solution is necessary, no, 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 not no. just what for is, Israel's security. I, I know what your opinion on a two-state solution is. What's your opinion on the legislation? It, I think it can be safely implied that a uh, piece of legislation that is uh, in opposition to a two-state solution is not something that we would uh, be thrilled about. But again, I don't have the expertise or the analysis of this okay. legislation to because know what bearing it would have on the um, overall process. What I can say, though, Matt, is that this is something that we're going to continue to engage directly with with Israeli leaders on. We believe that this is the direct uh, and most uh, uh, credible and real path forward for Israel's security to get the region out of an endless cycle of violence. Uh, and that's why we have continued to call on a two-state solution being a cornerstone of every uh, iteration and conversation that we have when we talk about uh, the future of this region and the future of the Israeli and the Palestinian people. Okay, but I, I'm just, it, it's interesting to me that you don't want to come out, you, you wouldn't come out and say, right, this off the top, off the top in response to the first question, that this is not, this something that you oppose and that this is because, not because I can recall less than two months ago, you guys weighing in very significantly on Georgia's parliament passing a law that you didn't like, on Uganda's parliament passing an anti LGBTQ law that you didn't like, and there was no reticence at all Matt, for you guys to call it out. And we, now it's like pulling teeth to get you to say something. I, like I don't this. think it's it's like pulling teeth. This first, this is something that uh, my understanding is just passed uh, earlier today or within the past 24 hours. Uh, the, what the full contents of this legislation are, um, I certainly haven't had uh, time to read it. I can't imagine Said or has or you have either, Matt. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. That being said, uh, our long-standing position on a two-state solution um, is, is, is quite clear, and we believe it continues to be uh, the only way to advance enduring peace. And it's something that we have made clear with Israeli officials uh, across its government, and it's something that we will continue to make clear uh, across. Okay. All right. Fair, fair enough. But yeah. I don't think that you can cite chapter and verse of the Georgia law or the Uganda law either. So, so don't, you know, you throw it back and say, well, you haven't read it. Um, we, we, we know what's Matt, the, the, the essential yeah, outline, these, which is basically what you knew 
about the two laws that I just mentioned these, in other countries. These are so, cir different circumstances, different countries. Well, I think these are a little bit are. apples but and the oranges. The point is, is that you are not shy about weighing in and we are, other countries' legislatures' decisions or you know votes. And and, and, we, and, and in this case, we are what? not we are not shy about making clear that uh, how vital we believe a two state solution to be okay. about uh, being the only way for an enduring peace. Have, Nick's well, patiently have, been I waiting. Have, I, have, I have a couple more questions. I'm sorry. You know, uh, I will come. Yeah. Oh, sorry, okay. Sorry All right. Go ahead. Say. But, but I just want to ask you a couple more. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, um, the, the Mossad leader, the Israeli intelligence uh, leader, said that Netanyahu is really intent on thwarting. Any deal? Do you have any comment on that? Did you hear the the Mossad uh, chief uh, what he said and so on? So for 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 obvious reasons, Said, I'm not right. going to negotiate or speak right. about the deliberative right. process from up here. What I can say is that we're working to get a deal. We're working to get a, a right. ceasefire and bring the hostages home. And we continue to believe a diplomatic resolution is achievable and urgent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hopeful about the direction that things are progressing in, um, and we believe, as I said, something is achievable. But I'm not going to get more uh, specific or offer commentary beyond that. Uh, but Mr. Bernier, the head of the Mossad, is the guy who is really heading the negotiations. So he knows. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows that his prime minister is not allowing him to go forward with the deal. You don't have a comment on that? I'm just not going to negotiate on this process in public, Saeed. Yeah. That would be unhelpful uh, uh, to the process. What I can say is that we are hopeful about the direction that things are progressing in. We believe a deal is both achievable. Uh, it's something that we have been working around the clock. It's an urgent priority for Secretary Blinken. Um, and this is something that we're working to, to get across the finish line. But I don't have, have more for you. you. Um, anything else on the region before I yes, let region. Nick go? Go ahead, Nick. This is on Iran. Yeah, okay, go ahead. States re up the uh, four month sanctions waiver for Iraq to buy yeah. electricity from Iran for, without being subject to sanctions. Uh, it's now really a good time to be granting or extending sanction waivers when Iran is plotting to assassinate the former president and others. And what, if any, ramifications will Iran face for that? So, uh, what ramifications it will pay it will face for plotting to assassinate? Okay, US these are for uh, uh two separate questions. First, let me just say on uh, the issue with Iraq, what this is about is this is something we have uh, renewed this waiver for the 22nd time, and it is about uh, the department permitting Iraq to uh, purchase uh, Iranian electricity while Iraq continues uh, to develop its domestic generation capacity and uh, continuing to uh, create its own independence off of Iranian um, uh, energy. These waivers are short-term and their stopgap measures to provide energy stability. That's ultimately what this is about, is we want the Iraqi people, uh, as we would want in any country, to have uh, access to consistent, safe um, uh, energy, which is vital to so many civilian uh, infrastructure projects, civilian um, establishments. It probably would be a, a waste of time for me to, to list them off. Uh, simultaneously, though, Nick, we are also encouraging the Iraqi government to take meaningful steps to accelerate its efforts to wean itself off of Iranian energy sources. Um, and over the past number of years, we have also seen that. Uh, currently, our estimates are that it, it relies on Iran for about 25% of its energy. Uh, just a few years ago, that number was 40%. And in recent years, we have seen uh, our partners in Iraq double its capacity uh, uh, for its own electrical um, generation. So we are seeing uh, progress and steps in the right direction, and we want to continue to see a clear plan, including um, realistic and measurable milestones. Now, Nick, separately um, on uh, the uh, other question that you mentioned, um, the Department of Homeland Security and uh, uh, the Department of Justice can speak to questions pertaining to um, the attempted assassination of former President Trump, as well as how other um, threats may or may not um, impact efforts uh, that are undertaken to protect uh, the former president. Uh, we're going to continue to do uh, what is necessary to protect our people, protect our interests from threats emanating from Iran. That, of course, includes 
includes uh, protecting uh, former officials from any threats that may potentially emanate uh, from Iran. And you have seen us uh, not hesitate to take appropriate actions against the Iranian regime or its proxies when American interests, its people, uh, or uh, uh, American officials um, have been threatened or uh, been put in harm's way. And that it continues to be the case. And for obvious reasons, um, it, uh, it should be no surprise to you. I'm not going to uh, preview what actions and steps we would take uh, from up here. No. Go ahead, Alex. But, uh, yeah. The White House this morning said that uh, th the threat is uh, credible. So if it's credible, let's back to Nick's original question, uh, what actions are you taking to first of all deter it, second of all to make Iran pay price? So in, in answering, I, I addressed this when speaking to Nick's question, Alex, I'm not going to speak to um, actions from up here. I'm not going to preview to them. That would be uh, not in the interest of our uh, national security. Uh, what I can say, though, is that we will not hesitate to take appropriate action um, to hold the Iranian regime accountable and to ensure that um, we're doing whatever is necessary to protect our people, including uh, former officials, and to protect our interests from threats that are emanating from Iran. It's Has the U.S. government reached out to Iranian uh, new uh, leadership? I'm just not going to tell I, them. I don't have any. Go. I don't have any diplomatic um, uh, conversations to read out. Okay. We've made this message. Uh, we've made this message uh, quite clear. I, think I have two more questions. Different topics. Uh, uh, I'm going to. I think there's a couple other back. on in this region. Then I will come back mm -hmm. to you. Dr. Uh, thank go you, Vedan. Just going back to the sanctions waiver to yeah. Iraq. There is a lot of concerns in the Congress that the transactions is fungible. And what restrictions and what limitations have you placed it in this uh, renewing sanctions waiver to Iraq that the Iran is not getting any single dollars from that waiver? So let's just re remember that as it relates to these funds, none of these funds from Iraq's purchase uh, ever enter Iran. The terms of the ele electricity waiver uh, uh, any notion that these kinds of funds are being released to Iran is um, is fake. And the important thing to remember here, DR, is that what we're talking about is not a specific dollar amount. It is a waiver authority that allows the purchase of, uh, of electricity over a certain period of time, in this case, 120 days. So it's permission for an activity over a, a, a period of time. And, and that's what this is. Yeah. One more question on that. Yeah. Per sources, per people that have talked at the State Department and the Iraq Iraqi mm -hmm. governments. The renewing sanctions is based on the progress that the Iraqi government is making towards the energy independence from Iran. Since 2018, you are renewing this sanctions waiver to Iraq. Yep. Uh, could you speak of the nature of this time's renewing? Is there any change? Is there any limitation that how much energy Iraq could buy from Iran in this uh, so the, the government of Iraq can speak to how much energy they may or may not need over the course of this 120-day uh, period that was just approved. Uh, but to the first part of your question I just talked about in answering Nick's question, we have over the past decade have seen some measurable steps of Iraq weaning off Iranian electricity. Like I said, currently we, we anticipate that uh, they are relying on Iran for about 25% of their electricity. A number of years ago, that number was 40%. Also, in recent years, we have seen Iraq uh, double its uh, electricity uh, generation capacity at home. So we are seeing uh, steps in the right direction when it comes to weaning itself off of uh, uh, Iranian energy, and uh, we'll continue to keep a close eye on that plan. Thank Rabia, you. go ahead. Thank you, Vedant. Uh, no. I just wanted to follow up on my question yesterday, uh, the photo, about, uh, photo of Israeli soldiers posing in front of the Turkish Palestinian hospital in Gaza. Uh, what is your reaction to this photo and the reports that, uh, you know, the IDF is using this hospital as their military base in Gaza. So we, um, we've uh, seen the reports on the Turkish hospital and we are in touch with Israeli counterparts to, to learn more. Um, and that's really all that uh, we can say at the moment on that. I think at face value when looking at that image, uh, what we see is we see uh, service members uh, posing in front of uh, the hospital. So I don't want to draw any uh, conclusions uh, beyond that. But we have asked the the IDF for uh, additional information, uh, and we look forward to receiving that. But beyond that, uh, that does not change the position that we have held for uh, quite some time now that um, Israelis need to conduct 
uh, their operations in such a way that uh, civilian infrastructure, um, uh, like hospitals, like schools, that harm to those kinds of infrastructures um, are not brought about by their operations. And that continues to be our, our will position. The, will the U.S. make its own assess, assessment uh, in this case on whether or not IDF is uh, uh, violating international at, at this law? Point, this is not the first time we are seeing at, at this point, we are, soldiers at this point, we have asked our civilian infrastructure and, you know, uh, using hospitals as their military base. We're, many we're, reports about we're, we're in touch with our Israeli counterparts and we're uh, looking to understand more and that's where we are in the process on this for now. Uh, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, so Russia's deputy foreign minister said today that Russia does not rule out the new, deployment, new deployments of nuclear missiles in response to the planned U.S. stationing of long-range conventional weapons in Germany with Interfax setting him as saying that the defense of Kaliningrad between Poland and Lithuania was a particular focus. Would you be concerned about such a deployment, or do you view this as posturing? And have you thought through possible responses? So I certainly wouldn't speak to uh, responses from here. And um, obviously, colleagues at the Pentagon can speak to that in greater detail. Uh, uh, of course, any kind of rhetoric, language, and talking about uh, uh, the use or deployment of uh, nuclear warheads is uh, of course, concerning um, and something that we'll continue to uh, pay close attention to. This is something that we have seen the Russians do uh, and say um, uh, and uh, thump their chests a little bit on for a number of, for quite some time now, dating back to even um, the early months of their uh, aggression into Ukraine. So I, I just don't want to uh, I don't want to speculate, but we are, of course, continuing to, to monitor closely. Okay, and then Germany next year plans yeah. to cut in half its military aid to Ukraine, saying it hopes that Ukraine will be able to meet the bulk of its military needs with $50 billion in loans from the proceeds of fro frozen Russian assets. Do you think those loans will be sufficient? So, uh, obviously... We're, when we're talking about the um, use of those those sovereign assets, that's something that the G7 worked uh, very closely on. So we have we no doubt believe that that is something that will be able to bolster uh, Ukrainians uh, the Ukrainians' efforts when it comes to defending their territorial integrity and sovereignty. Um, as it relates to the uh, Germans and their uh, own budgetary decisions, that's an internal process for them to speak to. What I can say is that over the course of this conflict, our, our German partners have been. Um, uh, irreplaceable and amazing to work with when it comes to uh, supporting our, our Ukrainian partners and broadly our allies and partners across Europe have uh, continued to shoulder an immense burden when it comes to supporting the Ukrainian people and we have no reason to think that that kind of support across Europe including in Germany itself uh, would not continue. And Germany's plans come despite concerns that U.S. support for Kyiv could potentially diminish if Trump returns to the White House. Have you had conversations with your German counterparts about these plans to cut aid in this context? And uh, we, we talked to our, uh, it's important to remember Germany is one of our uh, most key and important partners in Europe. We talk to them uh, regularly uh, around the clock. I don't have any specifics to share on, on, on this news, though. But does this increase your concerns about the future of military aid for Ukraine? Like I like I just said, we have no reason to believe that uh, aid from across Europe will not continue to be robust in supporting our Ukrainian partners. Leaders of these um, uh, European countries have themselves said that, including um, Chancellor Scholz. Uh, and the United States has also, since the passage of uh, the supplemental, we also have continued to show our support to our Ukrainian partners through PDAs and other kinds of uh, support, and we have no reason to think that that, that won't uh, continue uh, over the coming months as well. Okay, sorry, sure. just quickly on yeah. Evan Gershkovich. Yeah. His trial moves quickly through the witness testimony behind closed doors yeah. today. Was the embassy able to have access to his trial, and when was the last time the U.S. had contact with him? Sure. And then what's the latest on a potential prisoner exchange for him and Paul Whelan? So a couple of things. First, we are obviously watching this trial uh, very closely. Um, embassy Moscow was not able to be at the courtroom given the short notice uh, that they they were provided of its uh, date and some uh, additional logistical hurdles that they faced. Uh, in terms of uh, the most recent consular visit, uh, Ambassador Tracy visited Evan uh, on May 23rd. Um, and on broadly, let me just say that 
uh, we have been clear from the get-go that Evan did nothing wrong and should not have been detained uh, to date. Uh, Russia has provided no evidence of a crime and has failed to justify Evan's continued detention. Uh, Evan should not be detained. Uh, Paul Whelan should not be detained. And both of them should be immediately released. Um, as it relates to where we are in the process, I'm not going to uh, speak to negotiations in public. Uh, we are seeking the release of Evan Gershkovich and Paul Whelan as soon as possible. Um, the timeline of the trial and what uh, route that takes uh, does not have a bearing and has no impact on the urgency that the United States uh, uh, has been prioritizing in this effort. We want both of them home immediately and will continue to work uh, in this area until they're reunited with their loved ones. Go ahead, Thanks, Shannon. Uh, follow up on that, actually. Yeah. So Evan Grishkovich is due in court again tomorrow. Will U.S. diplomats be on hand for that hearing or attempt to gain access? We will certainly uh, attempt to gain access. I don't uh, have any more specific than that, but I'm, I'm happy to check with the team in Moscow and see if we can follow up with you. Thank you. And uh, the timeline of the trial that seems to have rocketed forward, does the State Department have any insight into why this timeline has been moved up? Is it because perhaps Russia is hoping to secure a deal? I don't have any assessment on why uh, Russia moved the trial up to this month. What I can say is that this timeline, first, I think it's important for us to note from here that this whole legal process is a sham uh, for Evan. Um, he is being wrongfully detained. He did nothing wrong. Uh, we have been clear about that from the onset. Uh, Again, I will use this opportunity to echo that Russia has provided no evidence of a crime and failed to justify the reason behind Evans' detention. Now, that being said, this fake sham legal process that uh, we are seeing play out has no bearing on the urgency that we have placed on uh, seeking a release of Evans' detention and seeking a release uh, for Paul Whelan as well, and we'll continue to work that process tirelessly. Can I follow up on that? Yeah, one? go when ahead. When was the last time there was any active substantive discussion between the U.S. and the Russians I, on this matter? To, it should be no surprise to you, I would not speak to uh, uh, those kinds of negotiations or process from up here. Has there been any other... Um, offers put on the table after I, the I, ones that you guys I'm just not going to negotiate in public. Thanks. Jenny, go ahead. Thank you, Bedant. Uh, North Korea. Mm -hmm. Recently, a series of North Korean diplomats overseas are defecting, defecting to friendly countries such as South Korea and the United States. The reason is said to be Kim Jong-un's pressure to fund nuclear and missile development. Uh, how do you view this situation? Well, it certainly should come uh, as no surprise that there are people in North Korea who want to leave uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the crushing oppression of uh, the DPRK regime. Um, specifically, though, Jenny, I don't have anything to offer on, 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 on the process. I'm sure our colleagues in uh, the ROK MFA may have more to speak to any specific defections. But uh, from our vantage point, it is, should be no surprise that there are uh, uh, members of the North Korean community who want desperately uh, to be somewhere where their basic human rights are uh, protected, where they have ease of access to democracy and basic human principles and freedoms. In the past year and a half, 20 North Korean diplomats have defected to South Korea. Uh, how many North Korean defectors have recently come to the United States? The state. Uh, I'm not aware of, of, of such a number. Uh, I, as in, I'm, I'm not aware, but I'm happy to, to check with the team for you, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Go, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Two questions, please. Thank you so much. Uh, one, as far as U.S. diplomacy and uh, foreign policy is concerned, this senator story from New Jersey has become a global issue now. My question is that uh, uh, many countries may have affected or may have benefited from his being on a long time on a foreign, uh, foreign policy uh, or a committee on international committee on foreign policy issues. Um, how the relations will be with those countries who may have benefited from his being on the committee on so, um, Goyle, I appreciate your question, but I am just going to defer to the Department of Justice, given that continues to be an, an ongoing law enforcement matter. And second, sir, as far as U.S.-India relations again, um, Prime Minister Modi's visit to 
Moscow meeting with Russia's President Putin was criticized here even by the Ukraine President and many others during the NATO summit in Washington. So how our relation, I mean, the relations with the U.S. and India is concerned as far as the visit and NATO here is concerned today. If you have any uh, talks with the Indian authorities or foreign minister or any others as far as his visit to Moscow is concerned. Well, look, um, broadly, India continues to be a, a, a country in which we partner with in a number of key areas, and that was uh, clearly on display um, last summer when uh, we hosted uh, Prime Minister Modi for a state visit. But uh, beyond that, in the context of uh, Ukraine and Russia's ongoing aggression and its infringement on Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, we continue to ask all our partners, including India, to support efforts to realize an enduring and just peace for Ukraine. And we urge Russia to withdraw troops from Ukraine's sovereign territory. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a Bangladesh issue. Student demand quota issue is in danger now. They killed more than 50 people today and seven on 16th, seven people killed on 60th. So big chaos going on there. What do you have? The prime minister is ordering police to kill students, innocent students. They are demanding for quota instead of less like uh, your uh, merit should be your knowledge, not the quota. So they are demanding a whole Bangladesh is in the chaos now. What you have? What do you have? What the so United States of America stands for it? Matt spoke a little bit about this earlier in the week, so I will just echo that we're continuing to monitor the reports of violence from the ongoing protests in and around Dhaka. Freedom of expression and peaceful assembly are essential building blocks to any thriving democracy, and we condemn the recent acts of violence in Bangladesh. Our thoughts are with those who have been killed or injured by this, and we're continuing to rely on media and contacts on the ground for information. Number two, number two is like military and BDR are on the road. So do you have any comment on that? So again, um, we need to make sure that the any uh, kind of freedom of expression is happening um, safely and um, people are free from violence. That's something we're continuing to pay close attention to, but I don't have any uh, additional updates on that. Thank you. Jolio, go ahead. Thank you very much, Vedan. Uh, first, a quick thank you from these two dozen Pakistani girls who visited State Department just two weeks ago. Uh, it's a student program, STEM. They especially emailed me as well. These are some unrecognized State Department's workers who play a wonderful role in doing these projects and something the U.S. government does for these poor countries. So thank you on behalf of them. Uh, just two questions. Um, uh, 50,000... Uh, Afghans in America, uh, in Pakistan are waiting to be uh, brought to the U.S. Uh, $20 million, according to my banking information, is every month is spent on them by the State Department. Uh, your comment on that, whether it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good use of the taxpayer's amount and uh, also whether you are aware that these uh, individuals that are there, they're involved in some anti-state activities in Pakistan. Like, uh, are, you, are you talking about specifically those who are SIVL? Those 50,000, not those millions of Afghans, those, those specifically 50,000 Afghans that the U.S. has, they are holding them in Pakistan. Uh, because the U.S. is doing their process to be brought to the U. Uh, right. So America. for um, uh, Afghan um, allies and partners who may be eligible for uh, relocation to the United States through the various sort of uh, pathways that may exist, whether it be SIVs or others, uh, we continue to focus on uh, doing everything we can to process those applicants as swiftly as possible. Um, we, of course, appreciate uh, the, the partnership of um, certain host countries, in this case uh, of Pakistan, and and we'll continue to do everything we can to, to process those uh, quickly and efficiently. Oh, but what I'm saying is, are you aware that some of them are involved? In I, 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 I involved? don't have any no. comment on that. Uh, just aware. one more question, sir. No. Um, in Pakistan, several journalists have now started using this term emergency, which is basically a sweet word for martial law in the country. Has it passed your ears that uh, these discussions are going on in Pakistan and your thoughts on that? It is not. <laughs> Thank the pink. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please give us an update or maybe details about U.S. Envoy Brett McGurk's visit to Middle East. 
Uh, Brett McGurk works at the White House, uh, so I will let them speak to uh, any of his engagements. What I can say broadly about uh, the efforts to get a ceasefire, as I said uh, when answering both Matt Lee and Saeed's question, is that uh, we are continuing to work this around the clock. We think that it is uh, a vital step that's necessary to do everything we can to get the region out of endless cycles of violence. Uh, it will be uh, irreplaceable in surging humanitarian assistance into Gaza, and it will be critical to making sure that all of the hostages uh, are released as well. Follow Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. On the humanitarian truce in the Eastern Democratic Republic mm -hmm. of Congo, what specific moves is the U.S. taking to ensure that this truce holds? So this is something that we are working uh, closely on with uh, the parties. Uh, we're going to work closely with the government of the DRC, Rwanda, and Angola to support regional diplomatic efforts to uh, reach a durable cessation of hostilities and set conditions for the voluntary return of displaced populations. We're closely monitoring um, the uh, truce, and we are going to work closely with the ad hoc verification mechanism. Um, since you've asked the question, I also want to offer that through uh, USAID and the Department of State and others, um, we've allocated more than $620 million in humanitarian aid uh, to the DRC uh, in fiscal year 2023, um, as well as uh, that, and that does not include our support to the UN, US, UN peacekeeping mission in MONUSCO. And then what outreach is the US administration making to Rwanda, which has been accused of supporting M23? Uh, I don't have any specific uh, diplomatic engagements to share, Daphne, beyond just saying that this is something that we'll uh, continue to work closely with uh, appropriate governments. Go ahead. Thank you, and then I have two questions on China, uh -huh. if I may. Um, uh, human rights issues. Uh, this Saturday, July 20th, uh, marks the 25th anniversary of the Chinese regime's persecution of Falun Gong. Uh, will the State Department take any action against Beijing to mark this occasion? So um, I don't have any uh, actions to uh, to preview from up here, but look, uh, broadly, uh, we have seen uh, uh, the PRC take a number of, of steps uh, as uh, over the past many years that we view as a crackdown on, on basic human rights. Uh, one, it is something that we will continue to raise with PRC officials directly. And two, uh, we won't hesitate to take appropriate actions from the U.S. government, and you've seen us uh, done so. And on the second question, in a, in a Hudson Institute event yesterday, researchers expressed uh, alarm about Chinese authorities' ability to freely spread propaganda about Falun Gong in the West. Um, is the State Department concerned about this? And what is the action plan to counter such growing influence operations in the West, uh, so, specifically uh, in the U.S.? Uh, uh, I, I will speak to this a little bit broadly because I don't want to speak about this uh, a specific context. Uh, we continue to see, uh, of course, that we are very vigilant about uh, the threat that of certain countries pose when it comes to spreading misinformation and disinformation, uh, not just within their own countries, but in other countries. Uh, domestically, here within the United States, uh, that is not the purview of, of, the, of the state Department. Of course, colleagues at uh, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice can speak uh, uh, more to that. But uh, broadly, in uh, combating misinformation and disinformation around the globe, we're deeply engaged on this. It's something that the Global Engagement Center, it's something that the Secretary uh, is prioritized on as well. Go Thank you, sir. A uh, few days ago, another Pakistani journalist, Hassan Zayb, uh, was killed in Pakistan. Overall, in 2024, eight Pakistani journalists have been killed in a broad daylight, uh, and uh, these killings highlighting the growing threats to be a workers in Pakistan. Any comments, any condolences? Well, journalists, journalists need to be protected, and they need to be allowed to do their jobs, whether that be the United States, whether that be Pakistan, whether that be uh, in the Gaza Strip. Um, that is something that uh, we feel strongly, um, and it's something that is uh, deeply personal uh, to the Secretary. It's obviously personal to us uh, and this team, having uh, spending most of our days engaging with you all. Uh, but simply put, journalists need to be protected and need to be able uh, to do their job. So last year, thanks uh, everybody. So last thanks year, thanks everybody. So, so I, thanks guys. Uh, <laughs>